Hey, YouTube family. I'm back. Like I promised with episode one. This is kind of a hard episode to do. Most of my, well, some of my family know, my closest family, and a few of my, one, a few of my closest friends know about what I'm about to tell you and reveal to the world. This is kind of big for me, but the fact that I've accepted myself before I even started my YouTube channel and found out who I was and did the research and asked questions with family members, I really found out me. I found me. And now that I'm comfortable with me, I'm comfortable with sharing it with you. Because it could be somebody out there going through this too that doesn't know how to express it, hasn't went through the things that I went through as far as getting over it and getting and achieving my goals beyond it, living outside the box and being myself and not fearing being myself, I guess. I don't know. But however my story can help you, I'm here. And you have somebody, like I stated in my intro, in my last video, that I really had nobody to talk to. And I want to be that somebody for whoever's out there that has gone through what I'm about to reveal to you. I wrote a couple of things down so I wouldn't lose track. It's a couple of doctor's terms and big words. And I just want you to fully understand what I am and how I was born. So, this is my introduction, and let's do this. Hey, YouTube family, are you ready? All right, here we go. Hey, my YouTube family, Chris Phoenix is back, like I promised, with episode number one. As you can see in the title, it says, is he a girl? Is she a boy? I will be expressing to you my unique journey into this world. On August 24th, 1981, I was born at 11.11 p.m. at California Hospital, a day that defined my destiny. Unknowingly, my parents were autismal recessive, which means my mother and father were carrier parents. To simplify these technical doctor terms, with my parents, the sperm and egg were deficient in the proper chrom with the proper chromosomes to make a full girl or full boy, which means my mother at that time of conception had two eggs and two sperm fertilized within each other. Then they fused together to form a chimera, a human chimera embryo, which is me. A chimera is when a female and male embryo fused together, which gave me 47 chromosomes. My genetic mutation is XXY, whereas a male has XY and a female has XX. Chromosomes are somewhat technical. They define, to a certain extent, what sex you're gonna be when you're in that embryo sensitive phase, I learned. So technically, I am both male and female because I have both, both parts as I dig deeper. Coming out, in, coming out of the womb, I don't remember it. Now this part is from my mother because of course most of us are too young to remember things like that. She told me blatantly everything candidly. And she told me in a drunken state, but that's a whole nother episode. Stay tuned for that. But everything I talk about in all of my episodes are positive. My mother was young, disclaimer. And I don't fault her for any of the decisions she made, according to me. So, to say all that, 
Let's start. I'm coming out of the womb. The doctor pulls me out and she tells me I'm knocked out sleep with this full head of hair, one blue eye, one hazel eye, very bright skinned and not looking nothing like them. <laughs> I was hers. I was just, you know, in the womb. Babies look different when they grow up. But anyway, I came out and the doctor slapped my butt, of course, that's what they do. And I cried. Well, it took, could, took a couple of slaps because I was knocked out. I was asleep. I wasn't ready to come out. I was comfortable. Anyway, um, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not going to cry on camera. Period. Okay. <sighs> he says to my mother, Something's wrong with your child. We told you you were having a boy, but we see no penis. So they took all of these tests and come to find out I have an enlarged clitoris and I have they call oval testes, which are like not testicles, and they're not ovaries, but they're within the same, and which makes it to where I, can, I can't produce kids, but I do have the ovary tissue, and I have the testicular tissue. I have both. So that confused my mother and the doctor. This is 1981, mind you. There's not a lot of cases like this. So what they do is ask her, you have to decide which one you want. Basically genetic identity. Do you want a boy or a girl? The fact that it happened like that and when my father came in he said that I didn't want and it as a child and left her with that situation and the shit's decision to herself I couldn't blame her for whatever decision she made because that's a hard decision I'm putting myself in her position because I'm old enough to understand now and I get it it was hard so she decided, boy, make a long story short, with this birthing thing, this birthing situation, she decided to have a boy. Close family members had changed my diapers. They were like, pull on it. Maybe it'll get bigger. You know, old country people, they don't really know. We don't nobody really know what's wrong with me and what's going on. They just know I look like a boy on the outside, but my genitals say girl. So, growing up, I had to take hormone pills, hormone shots. In high school, I know my high school friends can probably remember me having to leave every Wednesday. They just didn't know why. This is why. I was going to take shots. Every Wednesday, they were hormone shots to keep everything maintained as a boy. Because on the outside, the testosterone was dominant. But on the inside of me, I have female tissue. I have female design also. So, it's, it's complicated, but hopefully, the way I explain it, you can kind of understand. And it's called hermaphroditism. Okay, so now that I've stated the facts, here's the story time. Is he a girl or is she a boy? As far as I'm concerned, I'm both. I identify to the world as a man. On my ID, I say man, and I tell you why. In a way, it makes life easier. Um, of course I accept who I am 
anybody asks me who I am today, I will explain to them who I am and how I am. Not putting everything out there, but giving enough to let feel, let them feel me. Um, I've done a lot of spiritual searching. Growing up, it was hard because I was confused. As a baby, only certain people could change my diaper because they didn't want nobody to know because the older I got, they was expecting it to grow, but it never grew. And and I'm speaking of my large clitoris. Um, other than that, as a kid, things were awkward. I couldn't stay on other people's houses. Um, one house I could stay on that was my, my uncle's house with my cousins. Those were memories, I had fun. But they never knew about me. They just thought I was a soft little boy. Um, they thought I was gay. So, that's basically what I ran with. This is nothing wrong with being gay. Um, yes, I'm attracted to men. And I know I'm all over the place, but I think you can follow me. So back to being a child. As far as growing up as a child, I had cousins that I played with. I had a few friends across the way, but no one ever really understood me. No one ever really got me, even my close people, because I was dealing with something that I couldn't tell nobody. It was a secret. I couldn't tell nobody why I had to sit down to pee and I was a boy, but I was a girl, and my mother was stressed out about it and drinking all the time and depressed and physically beating me. And I understand she was young, she was in her 20s. She was young and I don't blame her for that. I made peace with that. And on her deathbed, she asked me to forgive her and I did. So I love my mother dearly. Um, just as far as that goes, but I understand she blamed me for them not being together because of the way I was born. It was just me and her um, growing up until she met someone. And I had my adorable sister and brother. But growing up, it was totally different. I mostly stayed with my grandmother. No one had an idea of exactly what I was but my mother, and I didn't know who she told and what she told. She just, I just know she told me not to say anything. So staying with my grandmother and staying at home and staying close knit and in a box, not going too many places because they didn't want nobody to find out who I was and what I was because they really didn't know. Doctors told them, but they didn't really know either. Thank God for today and today's technology and information system. That's all I have to say. But back then it was really hard and no counseling was done as a child because they didn't know how to help me. So I, I acted out, formed eating disorders um, in my 20s, up and uppers, downers, marijuana, alcohol, you know, but I'm over that, it's a phase. And I thank God that I'm delivered from the dark side of the situation. I say the lighter side of the situation is, is that I do have some working parts. Um, no, I can't have any kids. Um, yes, I'm both male and female. I identify as both, but to society, I identify as male. Just stating facts and, re and repeating so you can understand fully who I am. I'm pausing because I'm holding back tears. I've, I've never thought I would do this. Growing up as a teenager, I was in a dark place. Going through puberty. <laughs> that was crazy. I had the, the feeling of a period. But the blood that came out wasn't like a normal period. And 
it was every six months or three months. It was up and down depending on my hormones. But I did have the pain, the symptoms. Um, going through adolescence, I didn't get dressed at gym ever. Um, made excuses, had doctor's notes to excuse me from gym. Most of the time I was trying to either go to theater class or um, choir. <laughs> Shout out to Reggie Andrews, like Saints. Um, but I'm just, uh, it was hard. High school was hard and it was fun at the same time because at, uh, people say I had this larger than life personality. So I hid, I hid behind the humor and my personality and acting and singing and 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 being the the funny person in the crowd you know what i mean that was who i was but it was also a mask too um everybody assumed i was gay yeah i got teased i got bullied but i always tend to stand up for myself i always fought for myself even though i had people fighting for me too i had a lot of support in high school never shared what I was or who I was in high school, but I had a lot of support. I had a lot of love. Um, versus the hated, I waited. Let me see what else can I cover in my story time with this. Um, as far as being a teenager, um, unfortunately my mother passed and that's when it got real with me, my body and my identity. I didn't have that one person that fully knew me and what I what I am and how I was born with me. She died December 14th, 1996. I was I had to go back to the 11th grade and I really just dove into acting. It was cathartic. Um, it was something that I, it was another escape. And it was, it was something that I could hide behind also, another mask. And pushing the pain deeper down, deeper down, ignoring everything and just dealing with things. I had to go live with other family members. They didn't understand. They didn't know why I had certain things and was acting a certain way or did certain things because of how I was born and the things that I was dealing with mentally and physically. I couldn't share with anybody. It was like basically I was losing my mind. I was eating, 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 throwing up, eating and throwing up. Whew. It was a whirlwind. It was a circle. It was crazy. But all I can say is thank you, Jesus, that I'm out of that whirlwind. And I've come to this point. I can't believe I'm actually sharing this. Okay, I covered coming out the womb and being an awkward child and that crazy teenage phase. Here now, here's being an adult. After my mother passed and I go stay with another cousin she was like a mother to me also. I stayed with her for a while and one day we were talking and we were talking about the past and she asked me about me being gay. And I think that was the first person I opened up to after my mother about the way I was born and she cried. And she told me she loved me, she accepted me and she knew it was something because it never grew. I mean, to a certain extent, yeah, we find the, I find the humor in all my darkness. And it never grew. I mean, they had to tell, say, I mean, figure out something. If I was a parent, and I'm probably speaking from this day and age and generation, I would ask questions. I would do research and go ask doctors. No, I'm not blaming them, but I'm just saying what I would have done. I guess it scared them, and they didn't they were scared to ask. I don't know. But however you... This is the result. But anyway, back to my, my cousin. We're having this talk and she said, if something ever happened to me, I wanna make sure you're protecting your cover like you've always been. 
And I just think that's a testimony to God because no matter, like, and I say that because it's kind of symbolic to my life. No matter what happens in my life, God has always been there. He's always, God has always sent somebody to a family member, a friend, a message, a check, a plate when I was hungry, shelter when I was homeless, a car when I was walking, a job when I really, really needed one, that extra help in college that they gave me. You know, God has always been there. So no, this is not a woe is me, this is a testimony. I just want to share with you all because I know somebody has gone through this. Somebody has been bullied for who they are, ashamed of who they are. I can't tell nobody right now as an adult who they are or be themselves with other people because they've been closed in on their life. I'm here to tell you it's okay. God is here and I am too. And there's other people like me. Not many, but there are people like me. We're all one and the same. We're all scared. Everybody has a fear. Everybody has something inside of them that they're scared to tell somebody. Be you. Be who you are no matter what. Because can't nobody be you but you. Love yourself, know yourself. Be honest with yourself first. And then you can be honest with anybody. And can't nobody tell you who you are. As an adult, it was hard. My cousin told me that and she passed away. <sighs> December 22nd, 10 o'clock in the morning, I hear alarms going off. It's almost Christmas, I'm not thinking anything. This is another mother to me, somebody that I told about me, that I can relate to, that I'm living with, that I can be myself. It's just me and her. I got a job. She got a job. We work and we close. And I knock on the door. I say, Benny, your alarm is going off. And she doesn't wake up. I say, I just bam on the door. And I remember her telling me what she told me about I'll always be covered. If something happens to her, she said, with that story, if something ever happens and I don't open my door, there's a key in the hallway. Get that key and open the door. I did that. And she was gone. When I found her, I kind of lost it. That was around 2000. I was in college. Thank God I finished college. Because after my two nervous breakdowns, I kind of lost it. Um, I was there for a year by myself, and that was a hard year for me, so hard. I think that was those years that I saw the devil. That was my darkest years, because I really felt like, it seemed like everybody I tell, they die. Or is it me? Am I cursed? But... Oh, excuse me, but it's okay because those two years, God blessed me. I was able to find myself a little bit closer, grow up a little bit, make mistakes, get messy, learn, and coming up to this point, one more death happened. That was crazy was my uncle. After my cousin passed, I had to move for um, financial reasons and house purposes and will, wills and you know, technicalities. We're not going to get into all that. I was just blessed to have somewhere to sleep. I slept in my car for a few, few days. I was homeless for a couple of days. Then I stayed with my cousin. That didn't work out, so... Something happened to where my grandmother and I, her house was full where I'm staying now. 
I had cousins and uncles staying there. Her house was full. And for some reason, I couldn't stay certain other places with family members because you know how people are. Like my great-grandmother say, everybody got a little hair and they mess. And you never know what a monkey eat till he mess. If you know what I mean, you never know what a person is until you live with them. And I've lived with some people and it ain't it. So he denied me to come back to his house. Um, family member. So no, we couldn't, we didn't have too many places to stay. My grandmother felt compelled to be in it with me, you know? But I want her to live her life and not worry about me. Cause I was a grown up by that point. A young adult, but still I was grown and I felt obligated to take care of myself. But she's always been there with me. So looking for me somewhere to stay. We went to my auntie's house, Stephanie. And she was making a Christmas meal and she said, you guys can stay with me for a while. Ain't too many people here. My my kids is, is, is grown and y'all are so welcome. She's a sweetheart. Rest her soul, she's a sweetheart. Ooh, Lord. Bless Jesus. After she fixed our plates and we talk for a while and vent and, you know, have a little R&R. &R. We come back to this house that I'm in now. The room that I'm sleeping in, that I'm even making this YouTube video in right now. This is in 2000 and one, I think 2001, the last horrific moment of my life as far as death goes, as far as something kind of face to face happening. Yeah, same, about same thing happened. My auntie Stephanie makes the plates. This is around Christmas time. And we come to this house. I walk to the door, my grandmother taking clothes out for my uncle because he's sick and we're bringing him food. He has diabetes, he had a trach in his throat. So we're bringing him food and I open the door. Well, I knock on the door first. He doesn't answer, of course. So. Something like I said, the body, the body has memory muscles. Not only fat memory muscles they have, they have that emotional memory muscle. To be on a more serious note. And instantly, when I knocked on that door and he didn't answer the first time, knowing he's in there, that second time I knocked, it went right back to my cousin that I, that I knocked on the door that I stayed with her. And you know the story. And... I open the door and he's gone. His trach is thrown over across the room. I can tell his sugar had dropped because the toaster oven was on and the food had burnt and he had passed out on the bed. At that point, I was in a state of shock. I couldn't, I, I just blacked out. And I paused for like five minutes and all I could hear when I came back to myself was Chris, Chris, come get these clothes. That was my grandmother. Because she was outside, remember, I'm telling you, she in the, getting clothes out the trunk and I'm bringing the food into him and he slid it like this. And I pushed him and his whole body moved. So of course, rigor mortis had set in. And I said, Darius, he didn't say anything. He's warm, but he's so stiff. I come back out to my grandmother and tell her, I said, Mama, he's dead. I said his name, and I said, he's dead. And she said, no, he not. She came back in here, and she laid next to him and just started rubbing his head and singing them, them old Negro spiritual Jesus songs, and I couldn't take it. So I walked outside. I have a country family old school and you fight might find the hilarity and humor in some dark things and we have our Medea moments so yeah she started rubbing his head and praising Jesus and thanking him and rubbing I couldn't take it I started crying and breaking down going outside so 
after all that happened, we come in, clean the house down, and we move in. So I'm saying this to say, God works in mysterious ways. They say the ways of sin is death, so no, God didn't cause it to happen, but he comes in those dark moments and he turns them around and makes them better. And you may see me crying, but I'm crying from a testimony of, I made it. I made it. Nobody's perfect. I was a huge liar. I was a liar of who I was, who I am, because I was ashamed. I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm living fearlessly, fearlessly and out loud. That's what a phoenix does. Those were some of my ashes I shared with you. I got lost, kind of lost in my story, but that did wrap it up. That was the last horrific thing, and we moved in this house. And from then, me and my grandmother grew, clo grew closer together. We've gotten older together. It went from her taking care of me to me end up taking care of her. And now, going into episode two, which will be tomorrow, I can share more with you. We got one of the big ones out the way, which was me, how I was born, and who I am, sexually, mentally, and physically as a person. I'm doing all these story times to, so you can gather me as a person before I even start those mukbangs or pranks or whatever else I have to show you that's a part of me. Just be patient, baby. There's layers to this shit. Be patient, stay vigil, and thank you for being here with me this long. I appreciate you, and I thank you, and I love you for free, all of you. Thank you for allowing me to be me. Episode 2 going to be a little bit lighter, though, because folks tired of crying. It's quarantine, shoot. It's time to eat. No, really, it's not time to eat. I've done that too much. I think that's episode four. But we're not going to get into all that, Jesus. Told y'all, it's a lot of layers. But anyway, I'm gone. <laughs>